Son, and Holy Ghost. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would move amongst us. We pray that as we read your word, as we hear from your word, that our hearts would be opened, that our minds would be transformed. And we ask, Lord, that if, you, if, if someone here or someone listening doesn't know you, that you would open their eyes because you are a God of saving. You save people. That's what you do. And so we ask that you would work even in that way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
The stone is rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. Go on, church.
We're going to read again from the Word of God, from Isaiah, verses 7 through 9, I think it was. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his sh- its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Amen. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame And I love that old cross Where the tear is defaced For a world of lost sinners was slain So I'll cherish the old
this light up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. God is good all the time. Amen, amen. We're going to read Isaiah 53, 10 through 12. It said, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offering and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in the hands, in his hands. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he pours out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made the intercession for the transgressors. Amen, amen.
the power of Christ in me. For all the life's first cry to my final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. He commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever play. God, you may be seated. And good evening. I almost said good morning as well myself. We're so used to that meeting on Sunday mornings that when we gather on an evening like this, it's a little different for us. But praise God. Thank you for all who are here this evening and those who are joining us as we gather to remember that evening when our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, gave his life for all who would believe in him. And you know, throughout the world, throughout this day, all day long, and even this evening and throughout the night, people are gathering and celebrating and remembering that event that happened, remembering that an innocent man came and gave his life. And looking back at that time, but then really for most people in a few days, they'll forget the significance of that. And they'll just go on with their lives and there's really no change. Nothing's of significance that has really made them consider what this time and this event and what we celebrate means for all mankind. An amazing story, an incredible story, one that continues to be told and continues to be uh, celebrated in nations and tongues and tribes throughout all the world. Even people who don't believe in Jesus Christ acknowledge that something happened, but it hasn't penetrated their hearts and to go about their lives living without a change. And this evening we're going to look at a part of that story, the story of Jesus, that was just a few hours of that whole evening that took place. So if you're able, would you please stand as we read John chapter 18, and we'll read verse 1 through 8. And the Word of God says, When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kindron Valley. And on the other side there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials of the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus replied. And Judas, the traitor, was standing with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. and We thank you for this evening. We thank you for this time that you've given us to gather and this place where we can come and worship and glorify you and to give you honor. And remember the sacrifice of your only begotten Son, Jesus, 
who came for us, who came to make a way for us to be right before you so that we once again can be restored into a perfect relationship with you as you designed and wanted for us to be in. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This story of Jesus, this innocent man who was falsely accused, then went through this illegal trial, and then was found guilty of charges that were trumped up, and then he was very publicly, very brutally, very uh, outward and horribly punished for crimes that he did not commit. It was very graphic what he went through. It was a horrible act. But he knew what he was going to go through. He knew why he was going to go through this. He knew that he was the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. This story had been foretold of since the beginning of time. And throughout the history of the Bible and throughout our history, we have told this over and over and over again. For thousands of years, the story of Jesus has been told. And we continue to tell it, not just on this evening or at this time, but throughout the whole year, we tell the story of Jesus. Because it is the only story through which a man or a woman, a person, can be made right with God. We tell it because it reminds us of the love of God for us. It is the only way to be made right with God. But why do we have to be made right with God? What was the whole purpose? Why was there a need for that redemptive work to happen? Well, that's because sin came and distorted what we were designed to be. And that's in a perfect relationship with God. When sin came in and severed that relationship, it distorted the whole purpose of man. And there had to be a way for that to be restored. God's perfect plan. We continue to tell the story and we continue to celebrate Jesus because sin continues to have the impact it does on mankind and to draw people away from God. Sin has not stopped distorting the purpose of God. Sin has not stopped trying to destroy mankind. So we tell about Jesus. We tell the story about this man who came. This one who came to make us right with God. Now the Bible talks about the wisest man other than Jesus, King Solomon. And King Solomon, people would come from all over to hear his words of wisdom and to hear what he had to say and for, uh, to hear the things that he knew and of, of his knowledge. And one of the things that he said in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20 is this. There is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. Not one. And that righteousness means to be right with God. To be in that place where you are in alignment in God's will, where God wants you to be, and there is no sin, nothing there. There is no one. All of us have sinned. And because of that separation, we need the saving grace and the salvation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says it this way in chapter 3 of the book of Romans. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have all together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Since the fall of man, everyone has sin in their life. Sin has made us imperfect. It has marred us. It has destroyed our eternal hope. And that's where Jesus came to restore that. And sin had to be satisfied by the shedding of blood. If we look at what the Bible tells us throughout the Old Testament, there's all of those sacrifices that were made that were pointing forward to the ultimate sacrifice of the Lamb of God. The sacrifices that were done was the shedding of blood. It was a, there would be an animal that would be sacrificed. And what was happening is that the person was putting their guilt, their shame on that animal. That animal would die, would be crucified, would be sacrificed. And that blood would cover that sin. It would appease for a time that wrong that was done. But it was really speaking about what was to come in the future. And it was 
foreshadowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to come and be the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice that would not cover the sins of man, but would take away the sins of man. Huge difference. The story of Jesus continues to be told because we need our sin forgiven. On that night, as we read, Jesus was in the garden and he was with his disciples. And Judas came with a detachment of soldiers to take him. And as they entered in, verse 8 of that same chapter tells us, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus knew everything that was going to happen to him. He knew what was about to happen. He knew that this is the purpose, the reason he came. And he went out to meet those soldiers. Jesus, knowing what we needed, he went out of heaven and came to earth to come and be with us, to walk among us and show us the way to honor God, the way to live, the way to please God the Father so that we could be made right with God through him. See, people are looking for whatever they can to make themselves right, to make themselves happy, to get them in a place where things are going well. These men didn't know what they were coming into. They came with weapons. There was a, a detachment, which means it was a big group of soldiers. They didn't know if it was just going to be Jesus by himself or the 12 disciples with him or the 11 because Judas had betrayed him. Up to this point, whenever Jesus was speaking or whenever, whenever Jesus was around, there was crowds of people. So they may have anticipated that there would be a large crowd of people there. So they came prepared for possibly the worst case scenario. But when they walked in and they asked the first person they see, it's Jesus, and he asks them, who are you looking for? Who did you come for? What is your purpose? He knew. They didn't. They thought they are just coming to get a man. We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, just a normal man who's causing trouble. And Jesus answers, I am he. And Scripture says that they fell back. They fell back. Verse 6, when Jesus answered, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. You got to wonder if they knew they're going for a man, if they knew they were going for a person, and they go in and there's this guy and says, I'm the guy you're looking for. It's me. Okay, great. Come on, let's go. Would have been that simple. But some of the original transcripts of this in Hebrew, when Jesus answered, he said, I am. The he was added after. And when he said, I am, they understood something far different. He says, I am that I am. They understood, now wait a minute, this is not just a normal person. I am that I am. I am the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am the savior. And when the power of God was present there, it hit them and those guys fell back because now they realize this is not just a normal man. And then Jesus asked them again, and now they're on the ground. Who did you come looking for? Who is it you want? Jesus knew. And he knew the spiritual condition they were in. And he knew that what they needed was standing right before them. But the redemptive work hadn't been completed yet. Couldn't finish there. Jesus had to finish out that whole purpose and plan of giving his life. Standing in their midst was the Holy One, the Lamb of God that we sang about. Who was going to shed his blood to take away the sins of all who would believe in him. Again in verse 7, again he asked them, who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. We're looking for a carnal man. We're looking for a regular guy. We're told he's causing trouble and we, we, we're supposed to come and take him. I am. I am salvation. But because God loved the world so much that he sent 
his only begotten son. He sent Jesus to come and walk among us and live a perfect life. So at the time of his choosing, he could give his life over and be that sacrifice. So that all who would believe in him would now accept him and live forever. He came to die so that we could live. Just like we read throughout the night in Isaiah 53. The suffering that Christ went through had to happen. He had to pay that price. It had to be that way. There was no other way for man to be made right. And now that we have that, come Sunday, (laughs) it's a different story. Come Sunday, we celebrate our resurrected Lord. It's not Easter, it's Resurrection Sunday is what we celebrate. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, in that same chapter, he says this in verse 21. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. Righteousness, being made right with God, is now made known. This righteousness from God comes how? Through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. Doesn't matter what time in history you were born. Doesn't matter your economic status. Doesn't matter your education level. Doesn't matter what country we were born in. Doesn't matter which language we speak. There is no difference. Why? For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God and are freely justified by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Because the Lamb of God came and gave his life so that we live. Who is it you want? Is what Jesus asked. The world is searching in all kinds of ways and all kinds of systems and all kinds of things to try to satisfy, to be happy and to be joyful. And Jesus is still asking, who is it you want? It's not in wealth. It's not in pleasure. It's not in titles. It's not in careers. It's not in education. It's not in some status. The joy of our salvation, the joy is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is who we want. He is who this world should be looking for. And as I said earlier, throughout the world this day, there's celebrations and memorials and services and things that are happening to remember this time. But sadly, in a few days, folks are going to just go about their lives and not realize the significance of what this meant. This evening we gather and we sing songs and we celebrate and we thank our Heavenly Father for sending His Son, Jesus Christ. And you know, just before this time, there was that Jesus, the Roman soldiers came from, Jesus was with His disciples in the upper room. And He was having what is known as the Last Supper, communion. And this evening we're going to celebrate that as well. And I can see the ushers are getting ready. So if you did not get your communion supplies, just raise your hands. They'll come out and get that to you. And we'll get prepared for that. And communion is where Christ was talking to his disciples. And he was in that upper room and he took bread and he tore that bread apart. Symbolizing his body that in a few hours was going to be torn apart. It was going to be beaten. The Bible says that he was mocked, he was laughed at, he was spat at, he was punched, his beard was pulled out, his back was ripped open. It was horrific, it was graphic. And that was what communion was showing. Tearing that bread apart was his body being torn. And then he passed a cup of wine and he asked them to drink that. And that was significant of his, bl- but his blood being poured out. That was just going to happen in a few hours. That's why we celebrate that here at Oasis. And in a few minutes, we'll take that together as a congregation. But let's pray. Father God, we do thank you. We thank you for this evening. We thank you that we can gather in this place that you have provided for us. Father, we thank you that throughout The whole world today, and even now and later on this evening, people are still going to gather and they're going to remember what this time means. 
But Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would move in a mighty way. And that would open up people's eyes and just not be a fairy tale, just not be a story that's told, just not be something that happened long, long, long ago and that people just look back on. But Lord, it was an event that changed the history of the world for mankind. Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit would be working in people's hearts as these several days this week has passed and these days coming up that people would question what was this all about? And that you would bring people to those who are questioning and doubting that they would be able to explain to them this amazing story, this incredible story, the story of love and redemption that you sent Jesus for us. We give you thanks, Father God, because you loved us first. And we give you thanks because you want us to be right with you and because you made that possible through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. In the book of Mark, chapter 14, verse 22, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. And in your cup is a little wafer represents the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for us. As we take this, we remember what he went through, the suffering that was upon him for the sins of the world. And it continues on. It says, Then he took the cup, gave things, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you, he said to them. And that's what this juice symbolizes, the blood of Christ that was shed on that cross for forgiveness of our sins. Let us take of that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving your life. Thank you for coming, living that perfect life, being the Lamb of God, not giving up on us, not shying away from Him. When you were mocked and being beaten, when you were being whipped, as a lamb, you said nothing. But you let that all come on to you. Because you loved us. You love all mankind. And you want us to be made right with God. And the only way for that to happen. Was with that perfect sacrifice. Being betrayed. Didn't stop you. Being threatened. Didn't stop you. Knowing that you would be horribly beaten. Didn't stop you. Knowing that you would be nailed to a cross. And be made a public spectacle did not stop you because you loved us and it was the only way the will of the Father for us to be made right in you and you paid the price for me, for each of us and for all who believe in you and all we can simply say is thank you we love you Lord And we thank you for making it possible. Amen. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon him. It's time for you to stand. No. 
still breath you gave heaven looked away the son of God was laid in darkness the battle in the grave the war on death was waged the power of hell forever As we close this evening, just to remind everyone that um, 
after our service, we're going to have a prayer vigil, so we'll be here till midnight if you'd like to stay and spend some time in prayer, or maybe some are uh, watching online that to come down. We'll be here uh, for the evening, just um, meditating and praying and giving God thanks for what he has done. And remember that on Sunday, <laughs> Resurrection Sunday, <laughs> we'll be gathering two services. We have a service at 7 o'clock, and then we'll have a different service at 9.30. So we want to invite you to that as well. The book of John, chapter 19, verse 28, says, Later knowing that all was now completed, and so the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. A jar of wine, a wine of vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stick of hyssop, and, of hyssop plant, and lifted it to his lips. When Jesus had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Praise God. The redemptive work had been finished. And it was at his time, at his choosing, that he breathed his last breath. It wasn't man who did it. It wasn't by chance. It was because God's perfect will was played out so that we would be made right with God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for this evening. And we thank you for this time. And as we dismiss from this building, Lord, but not from your presence, we are reminded that you are an awesome and incredible loving God. And that you sent your son for us. And that's what this evening is about. That's what we've been talking about and singing about. That's what we'll continue to think about and pray about. And thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for saying it is finished. It is finished. It's done. It's been paid for. It's been satisfied. All the sins of the world. And now all who believe in Jesus, who accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, are now made right before God the Father. We give you honor. We give you praise. And we pray it in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you.